May the peace and blessings of Allah be upon you all, dear viewers, and welcome to Fatawa, which is uh, back live. And we are going to be with you live every Saturday and uh, Wednesday, 9 p.m. Paris time. So, dear viewers, allow me to salute my guest at uh, Iqra Studio, Dr. Sami Mandur, professor at Al-Azhar University. Welcome, Dr. Sami. So before starting, allow me to remind you, dear viewers, that if you have questions, you may share them with us, dialing uh, the numbers that are going to appear on the screen. And we have another number, 00202338875591, via Skype, Iqra Fatawa, and via mail, fatawa at iqra.com. Also, visit our uh, Facebook page, facebook.com slash Iqra French, or Twitter at Iqra TV France. Dear viewers, so I'm going to start immediately asking the following question to our guest. We are going to talk about the fiqh, the jurisprudence. Let us make a quick definition so that we may uh, tell our viewers what is the fiqh. May the peace and blessings of Allah be upon his messenger Muhammad, his family, and his faithful companions. Before starting, we are going to try to stress on the fact that the fiqh has its own importance for all the Muslims and until the day of the judgment. We need to know also that fiqh has its own definition. What does the fiqh mean, the jurisprudence? Because there is a misunderstanding when we say fiqh, we refer to the sharia, to the Islamic law. So there is a misunderstanding sometimes among uh, some Muslims. We need to know exactly what the fiqh means in order to distinguish between uh, between the different uh, the, the different definish, uh, definitions the fiqh means faqih which is the person who comprehends who understands so we are learning we are uh, comprehending we are understanding in the domain of the fiqh of the jurisprudence it's the domain of instruction of learning so the muslim is asked from the beginning as the quran the noble quran uh, teaches us to understand and to comprehend the dispositions and the laws of uh, our religion, Islam, and that are happening and occurring every day. So from the linguistical point of view, this is what we mean by, by, by fiqh. But there is another aspect, which is the jurisprudential definition, like the terminology that has been set by the jurisprudence. It's the knowledge. So the fiqh is the knowledge of the dispositions, legal dispositions, that is uh, generated by the Islamic laws. So in Arabic, we say that we need to know and to have a uh, comprehensive knowledge about the Islamic laws. So we need to know about the, these dispositions of the science, the Islamic science. And we are trying to understand something very important, which is this, these legal dispositions, this, these ahkams, these laws. And they are legal dispositions that are uh, provided to us from a, a legal path, a legal way which is from a divine source. That's why we call them legal dispositions. But we have another restrict, uh, restriction, which is a practical restriction. Everything, everything we evoke in the fiqh, in the jurisprudence, are related to, the, uh, to this life's practices, the relation between the humankind and uh, the creator. And of course, the relationship between uh, humans themselves and uh, the society. So each activity concerning humankind on a daily basis is related to the jurisprudence. So everything that is related to the heart, to the faith, and to the day of judgment, all these things, 
are not related to the fiqh. This is related to the life, to our day-to-day -day li uh, life. These are our activities. But the legal dispositions are coming, have their source in another another domain. We need to have signs, tangible signs. When we mention the word ahkam, we have five dispositions. We talk about the illicit, the, un the unlawful, we, we talk about the illicit, the lawful, and we talk about the disliked, which is reprehensible, and we talk about anything that is recommended and about the obligation. So we have many things. These five di dispositions are going to allow us to judge an act. Is this act recommended, authorized, disliked, or uh, lawful and lawful? How are we going to judge this? Referring to these legal dispositions. Who is able to judge where we are talking well we are talking about the fiqh so we, we need a faqih a jurisprudence person who has the right to generate sentences and dispositions from these tangible signs from where these signs come they come from sources these sources are very clear and these sources are providing us with the signs that are going to allow us to set to set sentences the first source is the noble quran and then the sunnah we have other sources of course but who is habilitated to set these dispositions or to judge it's the faqih it's the person who has the knowledge in the domain of jurisprudence so we need someone who is instructed who who is well versed who has knowledge enough knowledge in many domains in many areas and this knowledge is going to allow him to give a sentence or uh, to conclude that this is the way this act needs to be judged. So this person needs to study in the, f in the universities of uh, Islamic law in order to give, uh, to give uh, fatwas, but we also talk about, uh, are talking about a faqih, someone who has a knowledge, a comprehensive, comprehensive knowledge in the domain of jurisprudence, in the domain of the hadith, the Sunnah, he needs to be well versed in the uh, Arabic language. In the domain of the Hadith, he needs to have a comprehensive uh, knowledge in the uh, uh, the, the modern, the contemporary knowledge. Also, he needs to have a contemporary uh, knowledge about uh, the contemporary sciences. Also, in order to give uh, to give these sentences and in order to be able to give an opinion a juridic opinion which is convenient to uh, the problem or the issue that we are dealing with so we can talk also about the ishtihad which is the reflection the deep reflection that the person is going to make and this person needs to possess this knowledge in several areas, various contexts of the, the Islamic history in order to be able to give a judgment regarding any incident, any event. In Egypt, for instance, we have problems that require us to have experts in several domains. So we have the individual ishtihad, which is which is the the personal reflection, but we have we have also collective reflection that needs to be done, and the person is going to take under his responsibility the act of of uh, being instructed, of being well versed in the hadith science and in the several sciences of the Sharia. And in the meantime, about 
about the essential sciences in the in the in this life in politics in uh, sociology and in all the various um, the various domains in order to be able to give a religious opinion regarding this or that problem currently in our modern era in this century the essential is not the individual reflection but it's the collective uh, reflection because we have institutions and organizations that are well versed in the domain of the sharia law we have experts in the domain of fiqh in the jurisprudence and these institutions are very important like al azhar for instance the associations of the Islamic sciences, and we have another institution in Jeddah. We have also these kind of institutions in Europe also. So you have many of these that are going to take under their umbrella the duty of observing this or that issue, starting, of course, from a serious study that requires to be well-versed in def different domains in order to provide a fatwa, in order to provide a legal opinion regarding a certain incident occurring in the life of a Muslim, whether here in Egypt or in any other place in this uh, Arab Muslim world. This is what we call the collective reflection. From my point of view, the collective reflection is way better than the individual reflection because when we do this collective reflection, we are making a consensus and we are dealing with many experts who are well versed in different domains. For instance, if I have a problem that is related to the ec to economics, for instance, me personally, I don't have enough knowledge in this in this topic, so I need to refer to an expert in the domain of economics or an expert in medicine. If we have an if we are dealing with an issue that is related to uh, to a medical uh, aspect of uh, of the problem. So that's why the, collect the collective reflection is way better from a, my point of view than the individual reflection. And in this case, in, 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 uh, instead of going and uh, uh, searching about this or this issue, at least we have these experts with us who are going to provide us with the knowledge that we, that we need and we are, they are going to shed light on the different rules the, the different rules regarding the jurisprudence and this is the the work of the person who is going to provide the sentences starting and working of course from the essential sources so this is the definition of the jurisprudence but we need to to find the sources of the of the fiqh or, or the jurisprudence in uh, which are two essential ones, i.e., the Noble Quran and the Sunnah. So now the Muslims, among the Muslims, we need to have a group of people who is going to to have uh, the responsibility to instruct and to educate themselves about the legal dispositions. We need to, to have people who are well versed and very knowledgeable about the Islamic principles in, in order to, to be able to manage their uh, daily life. We have a very important hadith in order to incite the Muslims to, to get knowledge about the religion. The Prophet, peace be upon him, says those who need to gain to gain all the good in their life need to be instructed, need to be well versed in all the areas of the Islam. And we have another hadith also. You have two categories of Muslims. 
you have one that is is a very well lis is 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 listening very well but doesn't have the capacity or the possibility to to go beyond this listening skills this category cannot read between the lines and the prophet peace be upon him said uh, talked about two categories so he's in the hadith the prophet says Allah distinguish between these two people. Uh, a person who, who is listening to the hadith, but he is not trying to go in depth and to try to interpret or to try to understand and comprehend this hadith on the third level. This person is going to listen to the hadith or to listen to the words of Allah, but is going to memorize them without really trying to interpret them or to meditate on them. So this hadith talks about the person who is ha, who has the ability and the skills of memorizing the the hadith and to transmit the words of the prophet. This person has transmitted these these uh, words to another person who has assimilated, who has comprehended these words, then he conveyed the message that he has that he has uh, learned from these uh, these words. And then this message is going to be conveyed to the th to a third person who is going to meditate and to reflect on these words of our beloved prophet, peace be upon him, and is going to give an opinion, a religious uh, opinion through this message contained in the words of, of our beloved prophet. So now, I am trying to read books about jurisprudence, but I don't. I cannot go beyond this simple reading. But if I bring this fiqh or this uh, these books to another person who is able, more able than me, to convey and understand the message contained in these books, these books, then this is going to help the Muslim community to solve their problems. I want to ask you a little question. Why do we have different schools of jurisprudence? Why do we have different opinions all the time? This diversity, is it a good thing? We need to start from universal rule, which is a universal sign, a divine sign. Diversity is a blessed thing. I don't, I'm not talking about the capital. Yes, we have different schools, but f among the signs of Allah, glory to him, is that he had made us different. And f among his signs, glory to him, is the difference of our colors, our ethnicities, our, uh, our languages. These are the signs of our uh, creator. So when Allah created us, he created us from one man, Adam, and from Adam, an entire humanity has been created. So Allah addresses us saying, you have been made from a male and a female, and you have been made uh, from tribes in order for you to know each other and to cohabitate with each other. So I think that diversity is really a divine rule. It's a sign. After the break. Thank you very much. So we will meet you after the break. Stay with us. Welcome back, dear viewers, uh, to f your program for Tawa. So before the break, we were talking about the fiqh jurisprudence in Islam.
Dr. Sami, how do you react in front of this different opinions in fiqh, according to you? We need to know about the source of it, uh, this uh, divergency. I don't like to use the word difference, but rather divergency. And we need to understand the reasons of this divergency. Let's take a look on the hadith that is going to illustrate this problematic. The Prophet, peace be upon him, when he sent Mu'adh, it's a, an essential hadith and very important hadith. Mu'adh was sent by our beloved Prophet, peace be upon him, uh, to Yemen as a messenger, a as, a as someone who is going to transmit the message of Islam. So when the Prophet asked him, Mu'ad, you are going to be in front of many people and you will be faced with problems, you will be asked questions. How are you going to judge? What is the tool that you are going to use in order to, ju to, to judge? What is your reference? when you are going to give a categoric, uh, cate categorical uh, judgment. Mu'adh said, I need to refer to the Qur'an, to the Noble Qur'an. I need to judge using the source, the Noble Source, which is the Qur'an. So the Prophet asked him, and if you don't find in the Qur'an something that will uh, allow you to give a solution to this problem you are faced with. What are you going to use to do your t to provide your judgment? And the answer was, I'm going to use the sunnah. So this is how we should deal with things. If we are faced with a question and we are not uh, finding our solutions in the Noble Quran or in the Sunnah, we are going to look for the principles. If we don't find any texts that we are going to base our judgment on, then we need to seek something else. That's why the Prophet, peace be upon him, asked Mu'ad, and if you don't find your solution, neither in the Quran nor in the Sunnah, what are you going to do? And Mu'ad said, I'm going to use my own opinion, and I'm going to do my best in order to give an adequate solution based on my own reflection. The hadith says, I'm going to do my best in order to give my point of view regarding a question that is occurring and to which there is no uh, a Quranic text, neither a sunnah to help me to help me give uh, this solution, the solution I'm, uh, I'm seeking. So that's why the Prophet, peace be upon him, talked to, the com to his faithful companions about the diversity. I'm going to provide you one example. Of course, there are many examples, but there's one that I really like to give to, to Muslims in order for them to know that the diversity in the jurisprudence domain we are talking about jurisprudence, we are not talking about sharia. So that's, you need to, to do this distinction. When we talk about sharia, we are talking about rules, immutable uh, rules, unchangeable rules. It's not variable. But when we talk about fiqh or jurisprudence, you need to understand the Quranic text and then you are going to try to provide a judgment regarding an issue or a topic. So here you have the Sharia, generally speaking, but behind this you have the jurisprudence, which is the comprehension of the Sharia, which will consist on in doing a link between the Sharia and life. So the link between these both components is the Faqih, is the, risk, the, the Juris Consult. And here we you have activities, how are you going to manage these activities, activities based on the rules 
and on the comprehension of text. So the Prophet informed his companions when he told them once, none will pray the Asr prayer unless he does it in Bani Quraida. So, so you need to perform the Asr prayer at Bani Quraida. So this is a directive and an orientation, a commandment that was provided by our Prophet, peace be upon him. So the Muslims went to Bani Quraida. But the Prophet, peace be upon him, said none will pray the, perform the Asr prayer except in Bani Quraida. We have to comprehend. We can comprehend this saying, this prophetic saying, uh, using two ways. There is a divergency here in the comprehension of this hadith. The first category of the companions understood that the prophet's message through this hadith is pressing them or is insisting in order to encourage them to go quickly to Bani Quraida. But the other group understood that we need to uh, to wait until we reach Bani Quraida in order to perform the Asr prayer. So the first category understood that we need to be in a hurry. We need to be to go quickly to Bani Quraida because the Prophet, peace be upon him, want us to reach them, to reach Bani Quraida quickly, to be, be able to perform the Asr prayer. These are the, uh, the, the group of people who want to see the end, the end goal of the Sharia. Ah. So what is the end goal here? It's to go quickly to Bani Quraida. So it's either we perform the prayer before or after, but the main goal is to go quickly and reach Bani Quraida. The other group has understood differently. They are literalists, which, mean, which means that they understood in the, 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 had the words of the, the Prophet, peace be upon him, in, 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 in its integral meaning. And they understood that they should wait to reach Bani Quraida before they perform the Asr prayer. So both are both correct? Wait, please. Both have understood. We have two ways of understanding the hadith of the Prophet, peace be upon him, during his time. Both of them have have done things the way they understood them. One group waited until they reached Bani Quraida, and the second one understood it uh, differently. So how are we going to, to uh, like, uh, divide the apple by two? How are we going to set uh, an opinion? Is the first group um, correct or the other group correct uh, how are we going to to really understand which is more rightful than the other well the diversity here doesn't alter the essence of the message which is going to Bani Quraida so whether we do our, our prayer before or until we reach Bani Quraida, this is not the, the main point of the hadith. This is an example to illustrate the diversity in comprehending the words of of the, te the Quranic texts or, or the words of the hadith. You have, for instance, he, for instance the, the polysemy, which is a word that has two meanings. And we understand this. Uh, it's a phenomena that, and that exists in all languages, even in Arabic. For instance, you have a word that, that has two meanings and that has two sig sig 
two meanings. So the, the Quran, which means in the Quran, for instance, we have a verse that says that the divorced women need to wait for three cycles. So the faqih or the juris consul needs to to understand this first, to be instructed, uh, well versed in the domain of the linguistic in the domain of in the linguistic uh, domain in the Arabic language, so a faqih or a jurist consult needs to ask his, himself a question, a following question: question What does the qurb word means mean? We have two meanings here. The qurb means the menstrua menstruation which is the periods of women. Another, in another meaning, it's the purity, which is the, the period of, of purity. So you have two contradic contradictory meanings when we say that Qur is menstruation, and in another meaning, we say that it's the period between the end of menstruation and the, the pure state of a, of a woman. So we have two contradictory meanings. So that's why we have two comprehensions here. We have two ways of understanding this verse. There's a group of, uh, of schools of thoughts that took and adopted the first meaning, and the other school of thoughts adopted the second meaning. Yes, we have divergency here. Maybe you have a fi figurative uh, meaning and a proper meaning. We are still talking about the linguistical aspect of a word. Lamastu, for instance, for instance, in Arabic, means to touch something. Is it uh, physically touching, or does it does it uh, does it mean that we need to touch physically? I mean, in a, in a, in a in a sexual in a sexual um, meaning of the word? Does it have a sexual connotation? So we have two judgments regarding this uh, this word, for instance. So we we need to have two group of uh, jurist councils that are going to give, uh, to give us the inter interpretation or the law that we are going to follow, referring to the, da the, different, me uh, the different meaning of the word of, uh, provided the from, from the same word. And we have another, so we were talking about the linguistical aspect, from, from this linguistical aspect, we can have divergencies, and both, diver both meaning are going to be taken into consideration. We need to have also something to keep something in mind, which is to understand the text itself, and this approach, the proper approach that we are going to approach the, the text. For instance, am I, for instance, am I going to be a literalist, like taking the words as they are, or am I going to see the end goal of, of the message? So if I am going to, to seek the, the purpose or the end goal, then, I'm, then I am going to give a different meaning from the group who is going to focus on the words as they are provided, literally. I can refer to Albert Uco, who, who was talking about a book, and he was giving many meanings to the title, to the title itself. There are so many possibilities to provide meanings of something that we are reading. So it all depends on the method we are adopting in order, or the approach we are adopting in order to interpret or to understand the text. So we have a direct and an indirect way of approaching approaching the 
the text. Yes, we have the Zahirit, which are those who are going to focus on the appearance of the text, on the, on the form of the text. So, for instance, uh, we are going when we are going to translate a text or a book, you are going to use different methods in translation, which is going to not uh, not to alter the text itself, but it's not just going to be different ways of translating the the message itself. Also, when we understand, we try to understand the hadith, the information, also. We need to ask ourselves the following questions, uh, uh, the following question when we talk about the school of thoughts, the, 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 the schools of jurisprudence, the jurist consults that we have, for instance. If I am a jurist consult and I'm a providing a solution or a judgment regarding an issue, uh, I think we have Zubaida from France with us, yes. If I have a hadith, that can resolve this issue, I need to refer to this hadith. But if I don't have a hadith as a source to help me to judge, then I need to use another tool. So, of course, we are going to talk about the authenticity of a hadith. Is it hadith weak? Is it strong? Is it authentic? So, all these methods are going to be used to understand or to give a solution for an issue. Zubaida from France, peace be upon you. Peace be upon you. Do you have a question? Yes. It has been two years since uh, I was doing uh, performing the pilgrimage. And I brought with me back home the water, the sacred water of Zamzam. But one day, a part of this sacred water was poured on the, on the ground. So I took a tissue and I wiped the floor with it and then I throw it in the toilet. I threw it in the toilet. And I feel really guilty. One second, please. One second, please, Zubaida. So drops of the sacred water were uh, thrown on the ground and you took the tissue and you wiped the floor with it. What did you do after that? Ah, you threw the tissue in the toilet unintentionally, unintentionally. Yeah, maybe uh, it really hurts me. I, I really feel guilty doing this. Yeah, you feel guilty because you have thrown the tissue in the toilet and this tissue contains drops of the sacred water. I don't think there is a problem because you didn't you didn't plan to do this. It was not uh, intentional. The, it's it's only water after all. The problem he will occur if you have recited verses of the Quran on this water. Then yes, in this case, you are not allowed to throw the pa the tissue in the toilet. This is the problem. This is where the problem is going to to occur. If you have recited verses of the Quran on this on this water, then yes, it uh, it would be a really uh, big problem to throw this tissue in uh, in the toilet. Yes, I'm still with you. It was only the water of Zamzam. Did you did you recite any? No, no, no. I didn't recite any verses. So, if Allah wills, there is no problem with it because you didn't do it with the bad intention. You didn't have any previous intention of throwing this tissue in the toilet. So, there is no problem. Don't worry at all, sister. Thank you very much. Because after I threw this tissue, I woke up and I was like, what did I do? I, it, I, I, I just threw it in the toilet. That's why I felt guilty. Inshallah, there's no problem because you didn't have any previous bad intention doing something uh, that you didn't plan before. May God bless you. Thank you very much. Do you have another question? Yes, I have a question. 
My husband has saved a certain amount of money. We both work. And we have a bank account. But when he felt, my husband felt that he was sick. We have. Ah, we have. We have. I am married to this to this uh, to this person, but he has two daughters who are not mine, who are not my daughters. So he was mar married before. So he has two daughters with another woman. So his other wife is still alive. His other wife is still alive. No, no, she died. She died. She passed away before he married. Before he married me. So after after her death, he remained a widow for 15 years, and then he married me. He has two daughters. I have two boys and a girl. Since he has a little bit of money, we both work. And since he's sick, he's a bit, he's a bit ill. He refused to put the names of my of my daughter and his daughters on this bank account. He only he only put the name of the ma of the boys. So I told him we are going to go to the bank in order for you to give to give uh, to be fair financially fair with the with the daughters also with the with the with the girls also because you you cannot give the entire amount for the boys only the girls need to have their share and when he went to the bank the owner of the bank refused to do that because because his his um, his uh, children are minors, and and we cannot provide a life insurance. Then I was added on the on the on the papers, and he decided he accepted to add my name on the bank on the bank account. But my daughters are, are still young and they cannot be added to the to the bank account. I have a, a life insurance and the the my daughter my daughters are added to it. Do I have to share this amount of money with all my children or is it only for me or is this amount only of money only for me i want to know how to deal with this question since the insurance the life insurance is has only my name on it is this money to money to me only or, or to all my children so all this amount of money is has been put on your name. Okay, he has this. Are you the one managing this amount, this uh, account? What is your question? So you're okay. Fine, I will, I will answer your question after the break. Thank you very much. After the break, we are going to answer your question. Stay with us. So, dear viewers, welcome back, dear viewers. We are with you live from 
Ekra Studios from Cairo with our guest, uh, Dr. Sami Mandur, professor at Al-Azhar University. So before the break, uh, our sister Zubaida asked two questions. The first one regarding the inheritance for her children. It's not an inheritance question here because since her husband died, the money is not his property, it's his wife's property. And the bank account is under the control and under the responsibility of the, or the charge of the, of, the, of the wife. When he was alive, he wanted to to give this amount of money to his boys, to his two sons, neglecting the daughters. It's very dangerous to, to act like this because the bro prophet, peace be open him, ordained us to be just and to obey Allah and to be fair towards our children. So while he was alive, he was committing a sin. Since there, was, uh, there were some procedures that were complicated, he did it under the control of the wife. Now the, this amount of money is possessed by the wife. So the wife needs to correct and to and to deal with this issue properly. I advise her, my advice to her is to, since she said that he used, they used to work, both of them used to work, if she can precise the total amount of her earned income, then she can take and uh, take aside this amount that she has earned and be sure, make sure that this, this amount that is taken is, is the amount of money that he, she has earned or she needs to distribute the entire amount of money fairly among the children and the boys are going to take double, double the share of the girls because we are talking about the inheritance, the, the inheritance issue here and the amount of money left by the husband to the family. So if she remembers the amount of money that she has earned, she needs to put it aside and then distribute the rest according to the Sharia law, which means the boys are going to take to have two shares of, of the girls. So this needs to be distributed according to the Sharia law, four, uh, four and by seven children, each boy needs to have double the amount of uh, his sister. In this way, the problem is going to be corrected. The, the mistake has been corrected. But she needs to be sure, to make sure that the amount is being fairly distributed. So uh, to do this, she needs to know what is the money that she has earned, put it aside, and distribute the rest according to the Sharia law. Because she has already two boys and a daughter, and he has two daughters already. So she needs to estimate or to assess what are the the amount of money th that sh not, that needs to be distributed among the the children. She is the one who needs to decide. It's a big responsibility. That's why my advice is that to to think wisely, to calculate uh, properly, and to give to give more to the children to to assess more to to the children than to her when she does the calculation i hope that you have understood uh, sister 
how to deal with this issue. So I want to go back to the question of the jurisprudence because the divergencies in the opinions and the, the sources of the fiqh or jurisprudence, can we develop how are we going to use this to, um, to deal with certain problems in our life? We need to talk as jurist consult how, what is the source that is going to be taken into consideration and to to generate the legal dis dispositions. So we have two sources that we all agree upon, four sources at least, the Noble Quran, the Sunnah, the consensus, consensus and the comparison, uh, comparison by analogy. So we have sources that are used by juris, certain jurist councils and that are not recognized by others. For instance, you have uh, the Imam Malik, uh, may Allah be pleased with him, because we have four school of thoughts, but we have other schools of thoughts, but the most important ones are the four, the four ones, which is the Hanafi school, the Maliki school, Shafi'i school, and Hanbali. So we have these four schools uh, spread in the Muslim world. For instance, the Imam Malik, for him, the, the, the customs of people of M Medina are very important to him. So to him, after the Noble Quran and the Sunnah and the Ijma, which is the, the consensus and the comparison by analogy, he will go, he will refer to the customs of the people of Medina. So if the Imam Malik finds that people of Medina are doing certain things, he will reflect on these customs and will probably, this will lead him to to understand or to see that it's probably the way the Prophet, peace be upon him, was was doing or was uh, behaving. That's why he, uh, the customs of people of Medina were very important to the Imam of, to the Imam Malik. May Allah be pleased with him. We have other sources also. We have the morals, the excellence, the uh, companions' opinions, the many, many other sources that we can base, base our uh, studies and that some jurist councils are not agreeing with, but we still have them, and we still have different uh, point of views. But how are we going to manage this divergencies as a Muslim, what is the school of thought that I am asked to follow? I am a jurist consult. I am a Muslim. Am I, am I going to follow one school of thought? I am a Malikite, I am a Hanbalite, I am a Shafi'ite. Am I going to, to think this way? Or as a Muslim, I have to have a certain attitude, certain behavior that is going to allow me to have a comprehensive understanding of issues in my life. I am not a specialist and I'm not an expert. So how am I going to do, to do with, with the, the issues that are occurring in my life? A, a public person doesn't have any 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 precise way. I am a Muslim. I am an ordinary Muslim. I'm not a jurist consult. And now, in order to have a religious, a religious opinion regarding an issue, I need to visit a faqih, to ask a jurist consult. And this jurist consult is, belongs to the Maliki school. So, if this jurist consult belongs to a Maliki school, then me, as a Muslim who was seeking an information, I become a Malikite. So that I have a question. 
I have a question here. If you have a problem, for instance, and I'm going to ask a question for four school of thoughts. No, you have chosen one, Sheikh. You have chosen one juris consult. Logically speaking, you are not, go you are not going to ask uh, the four school of thoughts, and you are not going to ask the imam you are consulting what is your school of thoughts. You are going to just visit an expert, a specialist in the, in the domain of jurisprudence, and going to uh, try to make him shed light on the issue you are trying to resolve. For instance, and this just consult is going to give you the solution to your problem according to his own school of thought, the, the school of thought that he is following. Some Jewish consults are going, to, some people are going to, some imams are going to tell you according to the school of thought of uh, the Malikit and, or according to the school of thought of Hanbali, uh, etc. This is how each school dealt with this issue you are trying to resolve. So you, as an ordinary Muslim, you don't have a madhab, you don't have a, a legal school of thought. Your school of thought is the imam to which you have asked uh, your question. But you have uh, said that you have, we have various sources, very, uh, various um, school of thoughts. In addition to the four essential school of thoughts, yes, of course, uh, we have the main ones. Uh, the, the other ones have uh, disappeared. In Egypt, for instance, we have uh, we have a region here in uh, we have a region called Imam al Layth, which is one of the biggest jurist consult of his era, of his epoch. He was the disciple of the Imam Malik, may, uh, may Allah be pleased with him. And he has settled in Egypt. So he used to have a connection, a connection to Imam Malik. He used to have um, to agree with him on certain issues, and he used also to defer with him on, on other issues. So the different the different jurist consults has already resolved proper problems between them and in in uh, in dealing with certain questions. You have the another school of thought, Lauzai. At Beirut, you have the University of the Imam Awza'i. You have the Shia also. You have the who have their own school of thought, the Jafariya, for instance. You have the Jafari jurisprudence, which is recognized by Al Azhar, and that's used by Al Azhar in order to do the comparison between the different school of thoughts regarding a certain question or a certain issue in order to reach a common a common solution. We're going to take a short break and then come back. Stay with us, dear viewers, to talk about raising dogs, an issue that is asked very frequently. Welcome back, dear viewers, to your program, Fatawa. Dr. Sami, I wanted to ask you this question before going to the break, so I'm going to ask it again. If I have a problem and I'm going to ask an institution or a sheikh or imam or a faqih or a jurist consult, so we have the four main school of thoughts, as you mentioned, and we have other schools of thoughts. For instance, the school is going to tell me it's not permissible, it's illicit. The other school of thought is going to tell me you can do it, but you have to be very cautious and you have to take care of this and that. The third school of thought is going to 
tell me it's better not to do it. And I'm going to choose the first school of thought that told me to do it, that permitted me to do it. Is it allowed for me to choose whatever com is conven convenient to me? No, it's the Jewish consult that is going to choose for you the most preponderant opinion according to, to him in order to solve your problem. Because here you have a problem and you have a question. So you are seeking a solution, a religious opinion, a fatwa because there is always an amalgam between a hukum, which is a law, and it's not changeable. When it's licit or illicit, it doesn't change. What does change is the case of the person, how we adapt the hukum or the law to your case. And this is what should be to taken into consideration, you are going to go and seek a competent opinion, someone who is recognized as a jurist consult, because we can easily find many people who are going to pretend that they are jurist consults, but they are going to do to do uh, to provide many unreasonable fatwas, and this is not what we are, what we are looking for. So, we have preferred and we have given more importance to, as I said, the collective reflection, which is recognized by institutions and well-known institutions who have who have agreed on this uh, this type of these type of fatwas you have experts you have competent people you have skilled people who are going to study your question and then give you the the proper opinion that is going to be convenient to your case you shouldn't go you shouldn't choose yourself what is more convenient to you. You should just seek a person who is who has uh, who has a, l a long experience in in this in, in a certain domain, especially the question the domain related to your question, and. Uh, according to a serious study that has been done, is going to provide you with the appropriate fatwa. And this is what we should do. We shouldn't take things lightly because it's something that is related to our uh, relation with our Creator, with Allah, glory to Him. And we need to be very cautious. We need to be very careful and very smart dealing with these kind of things. We have so many things to say about uh, about this domain jurisprudence. You have also many books that are dealing with the reflection, with the fatawa, with the jurisprudence, but, but I rather seek official institutions that are recognized in the entire Muslim world. So I will read a few emails, a uh, few questions that we have received also on our Facebook page. Nasera, Nasera has asked the following question. I have a problem with my 12 years old daughter. She I have problems with her because she is sick and she is in a, in a school and they are having swimming classes. Am I allowed to lie so that my daughter doesn't go to the swimming class or am I asked to be sincere? and to give the real reason, even though if I have to pay a certain amount of money and to create problems with this, uh, with this with direction of this, uh, this school, because my daughter cannot attend the swimming class, actually. 
It's very complicated. Is it an obligatory class or is, or is it uh, facultative uh, optional class? If it's optional, I can just say no. My daughter is not going to to participate or to, to go to the swimming class. But if it's an obligatory class and if the do her daughter is not going to attend this class, then she might fail and she might, it, it might create problems in her, um, in her studies. So if there's mixity also, there's another problem also. Is it possible to ask if the swimming class are going to be both uh, boys and, and girls attending the same class or not? So if the class is obligatory, and if we don't have any other ways to change the course of things, like if it's mixed classes, are we going to say that we are sick the entire year? We cannot just pretend being sick the entire year. This will sound way really weird. And uh, the fact that she is um, absent all the time is going to create problems to the to the daughter. We have a caller from France. Yes. Peace be with you. Yes, you are. We hear you. You are live. I have a question, please. Yes, you may ask your question. My son is 15 years old, and he came back from the little pil pilgrimage, the Umrah. When he came back from Umrah, he performed dua there in order to memorize the Quran and then he came here and he doesn't want to go to the school anymore for several reasons because of his faith um, and what happens in these schools here in France and I really don't know what to do he doesn't want to go back to schools he is memorizing the Quran he is doing dua and he's persua persuaded that these schools are not the good atmosphere for him I really don't know how to act I really don't know how to deal with my son anymore he is determined to not go back the culture in France is really difficult of course he's attending the madrasa during the weekend he um, he memorizes the Quran with the sheikh and uh, his imam but he doesn't want to go to his regular school he really performed dua invocations and he doesn't want to change his uh, his mind thanks for going to answer your question of course we have Sumaya from France also may the peace be open you we wanted to know regarding uh, the traveler prayer if a person quits his uh, their home in the morning, does uh, does the person need to perform the the prayer before traveling? Do you have any other question? No, thank you. So the first question from France: Her son doesn't want to go to school anymore. It's a big problem indeed, because it's a misunderstanding. It's a misunderstanding among the young people. The fact to memorize the Quran is a very important thing to do. It's very pious. Coming from a, a young boy who came back from Umrah, may Allah accept his, his pilgrimage. But I think that this young, his, this young boy doesn't understand proper, properly the Quran. What is the first verse contained in the Noble Quran revealed to our beloved Prophet? It's Iqra. Iqra means read. Read, recite. This is the name of our channel, our station. Yes, indeed. When we say Iqra, what do we need to read? What do we need to read? Reading the universe. 
We read literally, of course, but how do we read the universe? We need to know, learn, we need to know, we need to have the tools and the instruments to help us in order, in order to understand and meditate on this universe, the creation of Allah, glory to him. So we need to learn. Not only the Noble Quran, of course the Quran is important. I read the Quran, I understand the Quran, I try to comprehend and meditate on the divine words. But are, th are uh, the knowledgeable people and those who don't know equal? No, of course not. So, it's better to do both. Of course, there is a great reward in memorizing the Quran. Uh, in the Quran and to memorize verses that will help me doing uh, prayers it's not an obligation to memorize it anyway anyways but it's a fard al kifaya which is a saf it's an obligation in sufficiency so if we have a Muslim who has memorized the, the Quran, it's a good example to be followed by the Muslims, but it's not an obligation. But to go to school, an ordinary school, and to learn in order to read this universe, it's an obligation in order to be a good element in the society, a good component of the society, in order to have a preponderant place in this society, which is going to habilitate, habilitate you to be a good Muslim, to help Muslims in your society. It's very important to go to your school. So it's an advice to the young people to well under to understand the Islam properly, to reflect on the on the Quran, to understand the Quran in order in order to provide better advice to other Muslims. So uh, my advice to the mother is to talk to her son, and I pray that Allah, glory to him, will help her to convince her son. So Aisha from France. Peace be upon you. Hello. Mm. Hello. Peace be upon you. My daughter has finished her, her studies, has graduated, but she's seeking a job. And everywhere she goes, they ask her to take off her uh, headscarf. Unfortunately, you know what the situation is, uh, how the situation is in the in the West. So she's uh, she en ended up staying at home because nobody wants to hire her. I really need an advice in order to comfort her, in order to provide some relief, emotional relief to her. She's really frustrated because she cannot work since she's wearing the head headscarf, the Islamic headscarf. Thank you very much for your question. We have Miriam from France also. Peace be upon you. I have a question, please, regarding the interests, the bank interests in um, saving account. Is it, oh, is it fine to give these interests uh, to family members that are in need, or is it illicit to use these interests to give them to those who really need money? As a Muslim family, what is the case? How are we, how are we going to get rid of these interests if it's haram to give them to people in need? I have one minute, 30 seconds to answer these questions. We have three questions, yes. We are going to answer the first one. So the travel, traveler prayer, there are two opinions. The first one, a distance needs to be established. And you need for the prayer to be shortened. I think the distance is 80 kilometers. So if this distance is fulfilled, then after quitting our place, then you can perform the traveler pray prayer. Another opinion stipulates that 
If I quit a province to another, from Paris to another place in France, I can do the, I can perform the traveler prayer. So you can, you have two opinions. You can choose whatever is convenient. For Aisha, I think we have answered the question many times for the headscarf. If there's no other choice, no other option to find a job, in this case, the necessity is going to force you to take off during the job or during the, the, the working hours and then put it back when you leave the workplace. 30 seconds to answer Miriam's question for the interest, bank interests, according to the majority of our jurist consults, it's forbidden, it's illicit how to manage them. If we talk about family members, if they are under your charge, then you cannot give these interests to these family members. You can get rid of these of this money to uh, giving it to Islamic centers or people in need. But mem family members who are not under your charge, you are not taking in charge these family members, then you can give them this money. So this is, we have reached the end of this episode. I want to thank my guest for being with us, dear viewers. I will meet you on Wednesday. Thank you very much. Peace be open you all.